BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Monday, another Zodiac Monday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Feel free to come on in and chill with the birds. So there are a couple of announcements that I would like to share with you guys. And the first is that this program, Black Box Online Radio, is going to have episodes coming out more frequently on the channel. In my original plan, I had imagined doing the longer podcast episodes, which you're listening to now, and then having some shorter episodes, which I had called Ned's Journal, that were supposed to be about five to ten minutes long. But I have to confess something to you. That's just not me. I'm somebody who can just talk and talk and talk for the extended periods of time. I don't think I ever released us a journal episode that was less than 10 minutes on this channel. I'm talking about the ones that came out most recently, maybe 15 minutes or 16 minutes, because, well, I like to discuss the subject, and I'm not being extremely tight with the time limit. But one thing that I did want to do in addition to that was to release a series of shorter episodes that would either genuinely be YouTube shorts, or maybe just put them out in one-minute videos, and it's just that. I wanted to do some shorter responses for people who have requested hearing the shorter episodes on this channel, and please look out for some one-minute book reviews here on Black Box Online Radio. I'm going to start with true crime books, of course, and naturally starting with the Zodiac Killer books. So in the very near future, to those listening to this live, you can look out for the first one, which will be done on Zodiac Unmasked by Robert Graysmith. I'm going to try to do a one-minute book review. And those are also going to come out periodically. The only real schedule on this channel that's going to be set in stone is having every Monday is Zodiac Monday. Wednesdays are now devoted to Jack the Ripper, and the Friday segment is the Anything Goes where any subject is fair game. I'm actually building up some steam with the weekend bonus episode that has been done on the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey, and I've been going through two different books, Presumed Guilty by Stephen Singular, as well as The Death of Innocence by Jean Benet's parents, and those episodes are coming out on the weekends. And if you would like to support any of these efforts, you can hit the like button and subscribe. It's a great way to help out the channel. Leave a comment in the section down below, and you can also share with your friends and family on social media if you know anyone who is curious about true crime cases. And you can also go over to buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88. There's a link to that in the description box. And anybody who makes a donation to help the show will get a shout-out here on Zodiac Monday. Normally, I save the supporter shout-outs for the end of the episode, but this week, I'm going to read them off at the beginning, and there's a very particular reason for that. The uh, first shout-out comes to us from Glenn Collins on buymeacoffee.com. I really enjoy your program, Ned. Keep up the good work, and thank you. No, thank you, Glenn. Very much appreciated for uh, your support. And the next one comes to us from Drew, who um, also has left the question, actually. Any chance you will be at CrimeCon this September in Orlando? As far as being a presenter at CrimeCon or a panelist of sorts, uh, no, I'm definitely not in that league yet. Would I love to go to CrimeCon just as a follower? Of course, because so many of the presenters are people that I follow. I mean, John Lord and Danielle Hallen are two YouTubers that I watch a lot, and they are always telling stories about CrimeCon and how they've had good times there. And even people who are off of YouTube, such as... 
Jack Vanek and Alexis Linkletter and Billy Jensen, people whom I followed on the podcast circuit. They also have appeared at CrimeCon in the past. I would love to. I don't have a direct plan to go there this year, but sometime in the near future, as long as we don't have something else like a pandemic going on, which shut it down that one year. Yeah, I would love to go to CrimeCon in the future. And our next one comes to us from Batman. I never get tired of saying that Batman bought you a coffee. And the Batman and has had something for us for Ripper Wednesday, and the there's going to be an episode that is going to be dedicated to his requested topic coming out on Wednesdays. As I said, you can hit the like button, subscribe, follow along if you're curious about these true crime cases. And the next supporter shout-out goes to Quinton Broom, who says, Thanks for being a regular guy that's really smart. Well, I don't know about that last part, but I definitely try to present the show as being a regular guy. And that's something that I think is quite different than a lot of the other people who are appearing at CrimeCon. I am most definitely not an expert on any of the true crime cases that I'm discussing, and I've always wanted that to be the flow of this channel. I'm just some guy who's watching documentaries and listening to podcasts and reading books like anybody else. And that's why I read so many of your comments in the sections down below, because we can explore the ideas together. We can compare and contrast. But um, I do appreciate that, Quinton. And lastly, we have one from Classic Chevy Cat who says, This is my second try. Hey, Ned, I finished typing my novel today. Over 83,000 words. I'm no typist. Now comes all the editing and proofing. But you inspired me to finish. Thanks so much. Classic Chevy Cat. Uh, much appreciated. And Classic Chevy Cat has been working on a novel that has been Zodiac-inspired. And that's why I wanted to begin with the supporter shout-outs, because I wanted to talk to you guys about some novels and books that have been inspired by the Zodiac Killer of the 1960s. Firstly, Classic Chevy Cat, I can't wait to read your book, and I can't wait to see it either in print or in electronic format. But I also wrote a book called Killer on a White Horse, which was inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, and there was a follow-up story in my second book, Down the Dark Lane. And on the New Year's episode, I said that my biggest regret of last year was I did a series called Zodiac Killer, the Moraga Connection, or started out as being called the Moraga Letters, then changed the title to the Moraga Connection, looking at some claims that were made by Sphere the Cube, a uh, researcher. And I said that my biggest regret was that that series didn't take off and reach more zodiologists. But I have to change that. My absolute biggest regret is that I did not proofread Down the Dark Lane as well as I should have. I have an electronic copy and a hard uh, paperback copy, actually, and I'm just always finding these little typos there that completely kill the vibe of, of the stories, including the one that is um, featured um, talking about the Killer on a White Horse continuation. And I'm planning to do more with that particular story. I'm writing something that's nonfiction right now, but I would love to get back to the White Horse Killer saga. And I have an entire book mapped out mentally. But I want to uh, just keep going with that particular story because, much like the Zodiac Killer mystery, it's unsolved. And I'm definitely going to be on the lookout for some more Zodiac Killer related novels, including the one from Classic Chevy Cat. But right now, I would like to give a shout-out to Joseph Covino, who has also completed a novel that was inspired by the Zodiac Killer of the 1960s, and it is called San Francisco's Finest, Gunning for the Zodiac. And I would like to read to you the description here that has been shared on Amazon.com. Firstly, one about Joseph Covino. Joseph Covino Jr. is a creative multi-genre novelist and an on-demand publisher for Epic Press Books. He is also an all-natural classic physique, physical culturist and practitioner of the health and fitness principles pioneered and perfected by champion world-class bodybuilder and filmdom's icon Hercules Steve Reeves. And that's his uh, bio. And here's the one about his book. For every action, there's a reaction. Unsavory Dave is the reaction. San Francisco's finest, gunning for the Zodiac. A suspense crime thriller novel speculates about what might happen if the original investigating officer in charge of the infamous Zodiac killer case was a dirty, hairy-like police detective. With the grisly murder of famous true crime writer and author of Zodiac books, former San Francisco homicide inspector Dave Tosky, 
a.k.a. Unsavory Dave, is called out of retirement to consult with two Italian city detectives, Moretti and Marino, a.k.a. the M&Ms, trying to track down a latter-day Zodiac killer who may or may not be a copycat. At the same time, the city's plagued by a separate series of serial crimes committed by a rogue gang of black Muslims trying to extort and control every aspect of private security and, comp and a company employing Toski as its operations director. Past and present collide once the black serial criminals are themselves stalked by this erstwhile serial killer. From its shocking commencement to its explosive conclusion, this novel advances a tantalizingly fresh new theory about the real-life Zodiac killer, which could be conceivably a guide to the present-day investigators to finally uncover and expose the elusive killer's long-sought true identity. And one more time, the name of this novel is San Francisco's Finest Gunnin' for the Zodiac. And I think that this is perhaps going to be a pretty good one. I was just reading the uh, preview there. But as some people might already notice that he chose to call Dave Toski, a real-life inspector on the Zodiac case, Unsavory Dave. Unsavory was actually the nickname of Paul Avery, the reporter from The Chronicle, who not only covered the Zodiac killer mystery, but also the disappearance of Patty Hearst. And he was known as Unsavory Avery. I have to give credit to that nickname for a little bit more rhyming power. The final piece of Zodiac Killer news is that I'm giving a shout-out to longtime BBOR follower Stefan Nyberg, who is working on an essay about the Zodiac Killer's exorcist letter from 1974, and he will be releasing that in the near future, so I'm going to keep my eyes open for that one. The exorcist letter is one that is truly different than the Zodiac Killer's other communications. Some people believe that the Exorcist letter was the Zodiac's final letter. Other people believe that the letters went on well into the 1970s, the Exorcist letter from 1974 again. So they think the letters went on well into the 1970s and then into the 1980s, maybe the 90s, or even into 2001 with a 2001 card. But the Exorcist letter has a direct quotation from the Mikado. I mean, it's not even trying to do anything other than quote the Mikado in that particular section. It starts out by saying, I saw and think that The Exorcist was the best satirical comedy ever. P.S. Uh, so it was firstly signed yours truly. P.S. Of, um, I'm, I'm drawing off of memory. This is why I'm jumbling it. But then it says he plunged himself into the billowy wave and an echo arose from the suicide's grave. Tit willow, tit willow, tit willow. P.S. If I don't see this note in your paper, I will do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of. And then there are these funky-looking pseudo-Japanese symbols. As I said, the reason I read that out of order, I didn't have the text in front of me. But you might notice that it doesn't begin with the famous line, this is the Zodiac speaking. The Zodiac Killer wrote numerous letters, as well as creating cryptograms and ciphers. But the letters, primarily from August of 1969 and onward, use the introductory line, this is the Zodiac speaking, but not the Exorcist letter, yet many people do believe that the Exorcist letter was a genuine Zodiac communication. It's also important to note that the Zodiac killer did not call himself the Zodiac in the first letter that was mailed on August 31st of 1969, where it states that um, he is the killer of two teenagers at Lake Herman Road last Christmas, as well as the murderer of a girl on the 4th of July, that girl being Darlene Farron. So I can't wait to see what Stefan Nyberg has composed in this essay on the Exorcist letter. I mean, is it going to tie into the um, artistic angles of this, referencing the Exorcist and the Mikado, as well as the other Japanese symbols at the end? Or is it going to be more about the theory that the, uh, the Exorcist letter is actually a suicide note? I would love to uh, see what Stefan is going to come up with. So uh, let's all wait patiently and eagerly and see what happens. Now I would like to go to a message that was sent into the email address. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. And this one comes to us from Andrew WVA, who says, Hello, Ned. I just wanted to point out something interesting I found in Robert Graysmith's book, Zodiac Unmasked, which I'll be discussing later today. In a section of the book with the date 1978 at the top of the page, Mr. Graysmith relates a conversation he had with Detective Dave Toski. The topic was an anonymous letter sent to Graysmith, and it discusses the possibility of a movie being made about the Zodiac Killer. At the time, it did not raise any red flags. Toski and Graysmith merely agreed to meet the Zodiac, but merely agreed that the Zodiac 
must have been a movie buff. But if we look at this letter and compare it to some things we know about Zodiac Killer suspect Richard Gajkowski, there are some interesting parallels that emerge. The letter reads as follows, to the editor or whoever is in charge of the Zodiac. Have you ever considered making a short film about the Zodiac, like some of the Hitchcocks, you know, when you have to come to your own conclusion for an ending as to who is the killer? If a movie could be made, it should be shown in those small theaters where mostly sex movies are shown so that it will look like some unknown thought of the idea just to make money all on something that sells. As I look at it, since the Zodiac takes so much pride in himself for his work, he'll probably love the thought of a movie about himself, and since he feels sure nobody knows him, there is no reason for him not to go and admire himself. Thank you. No name. Sorry for the mess, but I'm kind of in a hurry and I have work to do. The letter's wry and sometimes mocking tone, in my opinion, brings Zodiac to mind. Among other interests, Richard Gajkowski also had an interest in photography, which was credited with making several short films. And was credited, excuse me, it says, and was credited with making several short films. One might wonder why the letter writer would ask that a movie about the Zodiac Killer be shown in a small theater, where mostly sex movies are shown. Here is where another parallel with Richard Gajkowski comes into play. This is a quotation from Wikipedia. In the late 1960s, with the decline of its neighborhood, the Roxy became a pornography theater. In March of 1976, community leaders Robert Christopher Evans, Dick Gajkowski, Peter Moore, and Tom Meyer bought the Roxy, remodeled it, and turned it into an art and independent film center. Uh, bear in mind that um, the letter that Andrew WVA was talking about was written in 1978, two years after 1976. So this anonymous person requested a Zodiac movie be shown in exactly the type of theater Gajkowski invested in, and the letter writer also enjoyed and appeared to watch short films, as Richard did. Interesting indeed. Andrew WVA always appreciated. You've actually shared some really good things. And I do think that that is, um, you know, another strong point for Richard Gajkowski being a Zodiac killer suspect. All of that is circumstantial, mind you, and even the History Channel's um, own program that they released about uh, World's Greatest Unsolved Mysteries pointed at that out, that people can find so many coincidences with Gajkowski, they can find so many types of circumstantial points that lead you to believe that Gajkowski could have been the Zodiac Killer, but when it comes to hard evidence, that is somewhat lacking. However, again, credit to Andrew WVA, he was the one who shared something with me that was used in a previous Zodiac Killer News report where it was a solution to the Z13 cipher that shows about how the alphanumeric value of Gajkowski's name can be attributed to um, the Z13, and I thought that that was done in either somewhat of a very creative way or actually somewhat of a rather well done and sneaky way if that were indeed the true solution, and let's be very clear. You guys can tell that I don't think that Kike was the Zodiac 100%, but if it turns out that some guy like Gajkowski was the Zodiac, there is all of the, these pieces of evidence that are in favor of his guilt. Another suspect in that boat would be Arthur Lee Allen. I wouldn't be surprised for a second if Arthur Lee Allen were indeed the Zodiac. But I read a book mostly last year, and a little bit into this year, going into the Zodiac Unabomber connection, talking about how Ted Kaczynski could have been the Zodiac killer and the Unabomber. It's called The Unabomber and the Zodiac by Douglas Oswell. And I would be very, very surprised if it turned out that Kaczynski was actually the Zodiac. I mean, he's definitely lower on my list of suspects than Richard Gajkowski or Arthur Lee Allen. And I think that... Um, I've shared all of that enough in some of the previous Zodiac Monday episodes, so I don't want to go over that too much. Instead, I would like to go to a new piece of um, information that was actually sent in to the Facebook page. Not only is there a page for Black Box Online Radio, but I have to give credit to Batman66 once again for providing some info for BBOR and Zodiac Monday. And this relates to the unsolved murder of Alexander Harris. Now, back in 2021, I received a, a message from Richard Grinnell of ZodiacCiphers.com, who said that the suspect pool in the Zodiac Killer mystery is growing. It's like, I'm always talking about more and more suspects. Well, now it seems that some things have changed. And instead, 
there are more and more unsolved murders that people are trying to connect to the Zodiac Killer mystery. And there was an article that was written on the website TomDillardLasVegas.com, and it says, Alexander Harris and the Zodiac Killer Theory. And I had never heard of the murder of Alexander Harris before, but once again, big credit to Batman66 for sharing this with me. But the murder took place in State Line, Nevada, which is not an unfamiliar location in Zodiac research. Most notably, the disappearance of Donna Lass took place in State Line, Nevada. She was working at the Sahara Tahoe Hotel and Casino on September 6 of 1970, when she disappeared at some time between 1.40 a.m. and 2 a.m. I'm guessing that it's going to be a little bit closer to 1.45 a.m. She was just about to get off her shift, and she had an incomplete entry in her nurse's book. She worked at the first aid station at the Sahara Tahoe, and Whatever happened to Donna Lass is truly a mystery. Now, the article that was written on TomDillardLasVegas.com was rather jumbled and all over the map. And, I mean, that's that's coming from me, mind you. So I'm going to try my best to just read these segments that I felt were truly relevant to the murder of Alexander Harris as well as the Zodiac Killer mystery. This is going to start with a message that was written by somebody named Stephen who is sending it to Tom Dillard. Here's one from way out in left field, Detective Tom. I'm guessing you've heard of the Zodiac Killer, right? He was around while you were a cop with the Las Vegas PD, maybe even before. Back in the 1960s and 70s were when he was at his notorious peak. According to some accounts, he continued his murdering spree into the 1980s. In fact, according to the account I'll outline below, he may have even been responsible for a murder that you investigated in 1987 and 1988, and they arrested the wrong man for, who then turned around and sued you and your department for $1 million and settled out of court for $800,000. Almost 30 years later, it's a murder that has never been solved. In our research on the case, we found a piece of writing online under the byline of Gold Catcher that tied the murder of Alexander Harris, age 7, in State Line, Nevada, to the Zodiac Killer. According to the writings of Gold Catcher, Alexander was one of his last victims. This was well-publicized. This was a well-publicized kidnapping and murder in which Tom Dillard was the lead homicide detective. Alexander's killer has never been found, and the details connecting Alexander and the Zodiac serial killer are chilling. Now, immediately, this is still on the note of Richard Gajkowski. Gajkowski was brought forward as a Zodiac killer suspect by Goldcatcher, whose name is Blaine Blaine. And in addition to accusing him of the murder of Alexander Harris, which I only recently learned about, Blaine has also accused Richard Gajkowski of other crimes outside of the Zodiac's crime spree in 1968 and 69, notably the 1986 murder of Leonard Carl Smith. So... This is, once again, the theory that Gajkowski was a very prolific serial killer who got away with it, who simply did not get caught. But um, I'd like to get back to the article. This is how Goldcatcher tells his story in the online report. Goldcatcher had a long relationship with a Zodiac killer. He identifies the Zodiac as Richard J. Gajkowski of South Dakota, Geik for short. He says Geik died on April 30th of 2004. Well, um, Blaine does more than saying that. Gajkowski did indeed die in 2004 from cancer, actually. And Goldcatcher has a letter that he says was written by Geik, the Zodiac serial killer, and sent out in 1987. He's not clear as to whom the letter was, as to whom the letter was sent, perhaps to the San Francisco Chronicle, which was covering the Zodiac's activity rather heavily, and often received communications from him. In the letter, the Zodiac writes, Tell the blue pigs if they want me, I'll be driving around on Halloween in my death machine looking for some kitties to run over. Cars make nice weapons. The pigs can catch me if they can find me out there, just like in a movie. Tell the kitties to watch before they cross the streets on Halloween night. And um, this is, yes, referring to the 1987 letter. And to um, get to the full text, this is shared down below. Again, this would be either the Zodiac's words or a copycat mailing this letter in the 1980s. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. I am crack-proof. Tell Herb Cain that I am still here. I have always been here. Tell the blue pigs, if want me, I will be driving around Halloween night in my death machine looking for 
some kitties to run over. Cars make nice weapons. The pigs can catch me if they can find me. Just like in the movie, the car. Tell the kitties to watch before they cross the street on Halloween night. Tell Toski my new plans. Yours truly. And there's a zodiac symbol. There's the word guess. And then it says VPD zero. VPD most likely referring to the Vallejo Police Department. And you might have also noticed that that contains yet another film reference. At, um, and the Zodiac definitely seems to be somewhat of either a film buff or an avid movie fan, or even perhaps just a casual movie fan who chose to include these types of things in his writing. Now, to go back to the article here that is on TomDillardLasVegas.com, Alexander Harris was kidnapped and killed at Whiskey Pete's Casino in State Line, Nevada, less than a month after Halloween, on the day after Thanksgiving. Someone let Alexander out of the video arcade at the casino, suffocated him, and dumped his body under a trailer on the casino grounds. Howard Lee Haupt was accused of the crime, tried, and was found not guilty on all charges. The actual killer of Alexander has never been found. And that's what I think the writer was referring to by saying that somebody was accused and um, that person was found not guilty. This guy, Howard Lee Haupt, did not commit the murder of Alexander Harris, or the very least found not guilty of it. But this is why I have such a big problem with people trying to connect certain crimes to the Zodiac Killer mystery. Alexander Harris was seven years old. Did the Zodiac Killer ever target children? Yes and no. Most likely no. I mean, the youngest Zodiac Killer victim was Betty Lou Jensen, who was murdered when she was 16 years old. But even the most basic true crime follower will know that there's an enormous difference between targeting a teenager at 16 years old and targeting a child at 7 years old. I mean, some serial killers will not even go after children because even though they're serial killers, they still view them as some sort of innocent life forms or they resonate with being terrified and afraid when they were children and their reach is directed toward older people or their sexual motivations that are not related to children. But the fact of the matter is the Zodiac Killer did not target children this young. And anything's possible, right? Again, the Zodiac Killer case is unsolved and the murder of Alexander Harris is unsolved. But here's another point, though, that I think um, stands out to me immediately. Alexander Harris was suffocated. Now, in the 1980s, there is another Zodiac Killer victim that was suffocated, alleged Zodiac Killer victim, possible Zodiac Killer victim, and her name was Carolyn Eaton. She was also known as Valentine Sally, and she was found dead in Arizona, and they believe that she was actually suffocated and then left um, in the desert area, more or less, um, trying to be as simple as I can. But that's an unconfirmed crime, and the murder of Alexander Harris is also an unconfirmed crime. Um, the Zodiac Killer shot the victims, the Zodiac Killer stabbed the victims, and it's possible the Zodiac Killer did indeed abduct the victims, as previously stated, Donna Lass and Kathleen Johns, who the Zodiac could have abducted on March 22nd of 1970, but no, there's no evidence to suggest that the Zodiac ever suffocated a victim. And to uh, continue on with this, the body was dumped under a trailer on the casino grounds. Another point, the Zodiac didn't move the bodies of the victims. The Zodiac had a complete opportunity to do that at Lake Berryessa when Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard were tied up and the Zodiac approached them with a gun and a knife and was um, telling them the story about how he's an escaped convict from Mex escaped convict from Montana trying to get to Mexico. And he had them hogtied, stabbed them. He just left them there. Also, um, at Lake Herman Road, both victims were shot and completely immobile. The Zodiac could have moved the victims, but he did not. At Blue Rock Springs, I mean, even though Mike Mijo survived the Blue Rock Springs shooting, the Zodiac could have moved the victims in some way, but he did not. And you might be thinking, okay, well, at Lake Herman Road, Blue Rock Springs, Lake Berryessa, that, that was just done for practicality's sake. The Zodiac Killer didn't need to move the bodies of the victims because that would have risked um, getting caught. Perhaps with a victim like Alexander Harris, the, the killer chose to move his body because it would actually buy the killer some time, whereas Lake Herman Road was on a turn and like a curve in the road, and anybody who was driving by would see someone moving the body of a victim. Well, that would have a higher chance of 
the killer getting caught. Same story with Blue Rock Springs and at Lake Berryessa, same story with someone catching a glimpse of them. I completely, completely follow that type of thinking, that a killer is going to be practical when he needs to be practical, and he is going to um, do things to try and avoid getting caught when need be. But at the same time, I just have to restate it over and over again, the Zodiac Killer, in any example of something that is genuinely connected to the Zodiac case, did not move the bodies of the victims. I just wanted to be clear that other things are possible, though. Now, um, Alexander Harris was kidnapped and killed at Whiskey Pete's Casino, going back to the article. On display in the lobby at Whiskey Pete's, on the day of Alexander's abduction and murder, was a poster that, that said, The Car, and it was, and the car was, a 1934 Ford death machine that belonged to the infamous gangsters of that era, Bonnie and Clyde. The death machine is in reference to the car that Bonnie and Clyde were killed in when they were trapped at a roadblock and gunned down. It was riddled with bullets and holes, and it's still in the lobby of Whiskey Pete's today. I actually um, thought that Bonnie from Bonnie and Clyde uh, wasn't killed in that shootout, I thought that she was um, the first person, the first female to have been executed uh, by the um, state, but I, maybe I misremembered. The 1984 Newsweek magazine cover reference is important because the cover story on March 19th of that year was on stolen children who were missing. The cover photo was of Kevin Collins. Kevin, according to Goldcatcher's writings, related what Geik, the Zodiac killer, had told him, lived near Ke Geik. So, wow, that is a jumbled sentence. As I said, some things are really tricky. Kevin Collins lived near Gajkowski. Okay, that, there we go. Kevin H. 10 was abducted on February 10th of 1984 and has been missing ever since. Guy told Goldcatcher that he had kidnapped and killed Kevin on that date because he claimed that Kevin's mother had written him a letter saying that she didn't want her son hanging out with Guy at a storefront anymore. Guy apparently was teaching Kevin computer programming. Well, I mean, did that really happen? Do you ever just have those moments when someone is telling you a story and you're like, wow, that just sounds beyond belief, that somebody actually told Goldcatcher that he committed a murder? Yeah, you know that kid, Kevin Collins? I murdered him. Yeah, I abducted him, and I murdered him because his mom didn't want me uh, hanging out with him. I mean, I, I really don't want to just say that it's not true, but do you ever just have those moments when you start thinking that way? Goldcatcher said he found the magazine where Zodiac said it would be. Goldcatcher wrote that Geik used to proclaim, Kevin is in heaven. Well, any thoughts on this one? Has the latest print of that been found? Alexander's glasses have been compared to the glasses of Richard Geikowski. That's a question, mind you. That ends on a question mark. They're in the FBI fingerprint database file. Sure, it's a long shot, a really long shot, but when you have a lead, don't you follow it until it leads to something else? Doesn't Alexander Harris's killing warrant at least a quick fingerprint comparison? Well, why not, though? I mean, like, if you can dispel the exact connection between um, Alexander Harris and the Zodiac Killer, why not? Goldcatcher said for years that he tried to get someone in law enforcement to listen to him seriously, even if it's a dead end and he eliminates Gajkowski as a Zodiac suspect, or a suspect in the murder of Alexander Harris's death. Uh, isn't Alexander's life worth at least that? And for more info on Goldcatcher's writings on the Zodiac Killer, they are saying you can visit mkzodiac.com. It's mk-zodiac.com. There's like a little hyphen in the middle. But again, if they have the ability to exclude Geik as a suspect in Alexander's crime, I don't see why not, though. But there are actually two crimes that are involved with this theory, that Gajkowski was the Zodiac killer, and not only was Alexander Harris a Zodiac victim, but also Kevin Collins was a Zodiac victim. And the suspect list is getting bigger, the victim list is getting bigger, and I wish that I just had a bigger way of trying to disprove these types of connections other than other than that psychological profiling stuff that I laid out, the behavioral profiling issues, talking about how the Zodiac's a completely different type of serial killer. And if I can give you my honest take on the subject, I know this isn't something I can bring into a court of law, but with both Alexander Harris and Kevin Collins, they appear to have been some type of opportunistic predator who is trying to go after children in vulnerable places, and the Zodiac Killer does not seem to be like that at all. The Zodiac Killer is someone who would sneak up on people who were involved in 
men and women heterosexual situations. Like at Lake Herman Road, there's a male and a female present. Blue Rock Springs, there's a male and a female present. Lake Berryessa, there's a male and a female present. And the only difference is the Stein murder, but there could be some reasons for that. It's just the Zodiac isn't someone who is a child snatcher. And I, that's, that is the view that I have to stand by until I see some harder convincing evidence to persuade in a different direction. But what do you think about the murder of Alexander Harris from uh, the 1980s? And what do you think about the um, abduction and disappearance of Kevin Collins from 1984? You can uh, share your ideas in the comments section down below. And a bigger challenge question that should also be asked at this point is, do you even believe that the Zodiac Killer was operating in the 1980s? I mean, some people think that the Zodiac committed the 1981 murder of Joan Webster. As I also said, some people think there's the 1982 murder of Carolyn Eaton, the um, 1986 murder of Leonard Carl Smith. I guess that's uh, skipping one, the 1984 um, murder of Kevin Collins, or the uh, missing uh, disappearance of Kevin Collins, which this article states that they believe Kevin Collins was murdered by the Zodiac, 1987 murder of... Uh, Alexander Harris. So, do you even believe that the Zodiac was truly operating in the 1980s? Some people think that the Zodiac committed that crime spree in 1968 and 69 and then ceased. That the Zodiac thought that he came too close to getting caught after the final confirmed crime, the murder of Paul Stein, on October 11th of 1969, and then just decided to only write letters because he already had the nation's attention or at the very least the Bay Area's attention. But, I mean, there are crime, possible crimes that go from 1970 all the way beyond anyone's wildest imagination. I mean, there are even an enormous amount of crimes in 1970 alone. I talked about the disappearance of Donna Lass and the abduction of Kathleen Johns, but last year on the channel I also uh, shared some things with you guys about the 1970 murder of John Leonard, which happened right after the disappearance of Donna Lass, except in Pennsylvania, mind you. The Zodiac really does get pulled into this nationwide theory that someone is responsible for crimes in all corners of the country. But I would like to go to the next segment here on Black Box Online Radio. I spent a large portion of this episode talking about the Zodiac Killer suspect Richard Gajkowski, but I would like to talk about the book In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, written by Mike Rodelli, and his Zodiac Killer suspect, Shel Cavale, Shel Cavale, a Norwegian American. Mike Rodelli posted a new book review of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo that was written by retired SFPD inspector Vince Rapetto, and this was made available on his Facebook page. In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, a sh Wow, wow, why don't I try that one again? In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, The Shocking True Identity of the Zodiac Killer by author Mike Rodelli is a book which builds a circumstantial case claiming the infamous serial killer known as the Zodiac was actually a successful San Francisco businessman who fit the psychological profile of a well-respected psychologist and criminal profiler Richard Walter developed via his analysis of the Zodiac murder crime scenes. Now, it's important to remember that Shel Cavale is not the only high-profile businessman who goes on to become a Zodiac Killer suspect. And there's the uh, channel out there, Real Zodiac Killer Identified 2023. I may have misstated that uh, channel's name. It's very long. But the recent um, revelations have been made involving a Zodiac Killer suspect named John Parr Cox. And you can find several videos about that here on YouTube, as well as a Zodiac Killer News report on John Park Cox. And he was, again, someone who also lived in the vicinity of Shel Cavale, relatively speaking. I repeat, relatively speaking, the same neighborhood, at least. And John Park Cox was not like Shel Cavale working in the automotive industry. He worked in the railroad industry. But back to uh, Mike Rodelli's um, book review. It's actually written by Vince Repetto, but of Mike Rodelli's book. Arguably the most famous unsolved series of murders in America, the Zodiac and his murders are well known and well chronicled. Many books, articles, and movies have been made, and many with their own particular theory of who the Zodiac might be. Mr. Rodelli's book builds a case piece by piece, uh, using meticulous circumstantial evidence until he convinces the reader that Shel Cavale, a noted and wealthy San Franciscan now deceased, is the vicious Zodiac killer. No one like me... Born in San Francisco, who grew up in the Bay Area and worked as a San Francisco police investigator for nearly 42 years, three of those in the homicide 
detail and assign to the Zodiac investigation can erase the Zodiac's crimes from our memories. The indelible impression of the Zodiac murders is, and always will be, an integral part of San Francisco history. Mr. Rodelli lays out a concise retelling of the Zodiac's murders and the evidence associated with the crime scenes and the victims. He lures the reader along with one circumstantial link after another, eventually pointing to Shel Cavale as the Zodiac murderer. Has Mike Rodelli solved the Zodiac murders? After reading his book In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, many will believe that he has, while I read it, it became clear to me that the book is derived from the voice not of the Zodiac and his murders, nor from Rodelli's suspect Shel Cavale. The intrigue of the book is Mike Rodelli himself. His novel approach to investigating the murders and his dogged determination in pursuing every lead, every bit of information or evidence, is interesting and astounding, especially considering Mr. Rodelli is an amateur investigator and was unpaid for his determination and diligence. For over two decades, Mike Rodelli has stalked his prey, patiently drawing the circle closer and tighter. Mr. Rodelli became the protagonist of this inquiry of a murder mystery over 50 years old. He brings to life the killings of the Zodiac and the reasons Shel Cavale and the Zodiac are different images of the same man. Ultimately, we may never definitively know who the Zodiac killer was, but one thing is clear after reading In the Shadow of Mount Diablo, Mike Rodelli has put forth effort, inspiration, and old-fashioned shoe leather into the Zodiac investigation more than anyone I know of. His work, his theory, and his book deserve serious consideration. And if you do read Mike Rodelli's books, I mean, I responded to the electronic version, The Hunt for Zodiac, he talks about how dates in Shel Cavale's life that had, would have had personal meaning to him line up with the dates of Zodiac activity, and he also talks about how Vallejo is a sister city of Trondheim, Norway, where Shel Cavale was born, and there are all types of synchronicity moments where it seems like there is this piece coming together, let alone that Shel Cavale would have had just the whole type of speed junkie, adrenaline junkie aspect where he does things for the thrill of it, chasing moments of intensity. But I think that that uh, book review is definitely a little bit one-sided, saying very, very favorable things. But here on Black Box Online Radio, I try to give a little bit more counterbalance. Now, I'm mostly curious, though, what uh, will happen with the new suspect, John Parr Cox, even, if there are going to be some more um, evaluations, if someone is going to be able to punch holes in any theory involving a Zodiac suspect, whether it's Shel Cavale or John Parr Cox, and find a way if they can definitively eliminate them. That's the stuff that I think will get us closer to revealing the Zodiac's true identity. But what do you think about um, any of the suspects mentioned in this episode? Arthur Lee Allen, Richard Gajkowski, Shel Cavale, John Parr Cox, as well as any of the theories involved, talking about the disappearance of Donna Lass, the murder of Alexander Harris, the disappearance of Kevin Collins, the abduction of Kathleen Johns. If you have anything that you would like to share, you can put your ideas in the comment section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box, and there is always BlackBoxNid88 over on Instagram, and I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Goodbye.